Calabial 3 geometry, there is a surface in it deforming, and then there is D4, D2, D0 brains wrapping the surface. We would like to calculate partition function of this particular instant on moduli space. Basically count how many of these things we can have and uh, which are somewhat uh, deformation invariance of this moduli space because the complex and scalar structure of this variety here, Calabial 3 is changing. So we discussed about this partition function counting solutions to a modification of the super Yangmos differential equations. Those are minimizers of the super Yangmos action integral. They count one one forms because those are harmonic forms and cohomologically harmonic forms are really curves. So as long as the curve, as in the picture, lies on some surface and together with the surface deforms compatibly inside the ambient threefold, count of those things will actually give us the partition function we are at. So let us um, study this mathematically. This is a good example because now you have seen the physics literature, physics motivation. Now I give you a translation of this to al algebraic ge geometry. Translation to algebraic geometry, okay? All right, so we wish to count, we wish to count pairs of the form Z inside H in X, where H is a suitable, it's going to be a suitable surface, but I want it to be ample surface, so ample, uh, suitable, ample, hypersurface, hypersurface, yes, in X, okay, and Z is that curve that lies on X, Z is a one-dimensional, we know that in algebraic geometry under deformations, we can always have something more than just a naked curve. One dimensional subscheme of H. So we have X, we have the hypersurface sitting inside X, and we have some non pure, non naked system of curves and points which represents this subscheme Z, one dimensional subscheme Z. Here, we demand H to be pure of dimension two. Pure of dimension two means that the same way that the subscheme one dimensional subscheme can have zero dimensional points attached to it, Two dimensional subscheme can also have one dimensional curves attached to it and zero dimensional points attached to it. So these points can also roam around off of this surface, for instance. That's not what we're after. When we say pure, it means that it's just a naked, naked subscheme. Sub pure means no, it has, it has no subscheme of dimension less, okay? So when you say pure subscheme of dimension two, it means that it's just a surface, okay? Pure subscheme of dimension one, it means that it's just a naked curve. So here, the Z is non-pure subscheme of dimension one. So it could have zero dimensional subscripts attached, okay? All right, however, uh -huh. so however, Z could be, would be scheme theoretically in terms of the language of the schemes, scheme theoretically, uh, non-pure, non-pure. And here X is a fixed 
is a fixed collabial threefold. Collabial threefold, okay? <coughs> With H1 of O of X equal to zero, symplectic. Okay, so H1 of O of X equal to zero. All right. Now, what does this H1 of the O of the structure sheaf imply? Since H1 of X O X, this is shift cohomology, is equal to zero, that implies that all the affirmations of H, okay, are in the linear system. Linear system, okay. Uh, which is H, this is the linear system of H, it's the projectization of H zero of OX um, twisted by the ample divisor H. You see, you have a surface, this surface divisor theoretically is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a line bundle. This line bundle is exactly shift of functions inside on X, which have meromorphic poles along H. When you put O of X, H, that's what it means. Complex geometry. You know what a meromorphic function is. It has a pole somewhere. If you wanna say that something has a pole along the subspace, that's the notation for it. O X twisted by H means it has meromorphic poles along H. If you put O X twisted by minus H, it means it has zeros. It vanishes on H, basically. That's the ideal shift of H inside O, basically, okay? So when you give me an ample surface, basically um, it has one-to-one -one correspondence with this line bundle, which is O X of H, okay? And linear system, of this H parameterizes all copies of H, which are deformations of H itself. So this linear system pictorially kind of looks at H, but all different copies of H kind of, that are deformation of one another. This is this linear system of H. That's what the linear system means, okay? If the ambient space has vanishing of O of X, then, the linear system is just a smooth vector space, which is projectivization of this H0 of all X of H with nothing, no obstruction to deform, to, for deformation, okay? Now, okay, so that's that. And then, um, um, what else? Uh, and by the way, um, if you have H, the normal bundle to H, this normal bundle to H inside the ambient space is in fact realized by this function, right? So H is zero of the normal bundle over H gives you possible deformations. And H zero is exactly H, H zero of O of X of H. If there are non-vanishing things in here, non-vanishing, H1 cohomology is in here, then the space that parameterizes possible deformations will not be just a smooth flat vector space because there are obstructions to those deformations. The fact that H1 of OX already is equal to zero implies that H1 of OX by H is also equal to zero. So the linear system completely captures everything. Okay, so now the linear system this linear system, linear system carries a universal hyperplane, hypersurface or hyper, hypersurface. So you see um, the linear system is like this. Uh, so it's over point spec of Z, for instance, and X is over there. And then you can look at the fiber product of these two things. That's your linear system, X. And this thing has some universal 
hypersurface on it. What does this universal hypersurface do? Uh, well, I mean, if you have this thing, um, this is um, basically somewhere inside here, and this gets mapped onto here, right? So as you evaluate this thing on one of the points in the linear system, you will get a hypersurface inside X. That's what it is, okay? Interesting. Now, this is the universal hypersurface. Now the choice of, uh, the choice of a curve sitting inside H sitting inside X are naturally parameterized, parameterized by the relative. Okay, you see, you have a linear system which looks at all possible deformations of this H inside ambient X. That's your linear system, okay? You have an object which is like a machine, this universal hyperplane. You evaluate it at the point of that linear system. It tells you exactly which page of the book you're looking at, which hypersurface you're looking at. That's the universal hypersurface or hyperplane. In here, if H is a hyperplane, then it's a universal hyperplane. Then you would like the curves to sit inside H and all possible deformations of H. Of course, we know that the space parameterizes sub schemes is the Hilbert scheme. If I had a fixed, fixed uh, H, then I could look at Hilbert scheme of curves inside this space H. That's the parameterization of all possible curves that lie on it. But I'm not interested in one copy of H, I'm interested in H deforming inside X and deformations of H are parameterized by the linear system. So that's something that for each page of that linear system, for each copy of the H I can pick in that linear system is a Hilbert scheme, that is space. So it's a union of all Hilbert schemes that you get if you vary H, right? Are you with me here, Mohammed? Yes. Perfect. So we would like the choice of ZHX inside X are naturally parameterized, okay, by the, this is called the relative Hilbert scheme. And you will know immediately why I call it a relative Hilbert scheme. Relative Hilbert scheme of one dimensional. One dimensional uh, sub schemes, one dimensional sub schemes of the fibers of fibers of universal hyperplane over the linear system of the hyperplane. Okay, so now you would say, what does this mean? So, okay, here is what it means. There is a space down here, which is the Hilbert scheme, oh, sorry, linear system of hyperplanes in X. This is space I'm drawing flat, but you shouldn't be thinking it's a plane, it's a space. This is the projectivization of H0 of OXH. This is that space. Okay, and then there is a universal hyperplane on it with a map to it. Okay, so what does this do? As soon as you give me a point in here, if you give me a point in this vector space, point P in here, that cuts a one of the pages of the book. That gives me one of these um, hyperplanes, right? That would be H. That essentially gives me one of those things. So, okay, so what is happening, right? So, H, that gives me one of these H's times X, right? And then, um, which is isomorphic to universal hyperplane over H times a point. You see how interesting this is? You see, do you see what I'm doing? You have H tilde mapped to here 
I give a point in here, it maps to here. If I look at the fiber product of these two things, over this linear system, over this linear system, that's isomorphic to choice of one of those hyperplanes times X. And why times X? Because this guy is inside H times X, actually. That's why. You see? This is the fiber diagram that you're looking at. Okay. So is this what we want? All right. So we get this H. This H is inside ambient space H, uh, X. And what we want is the Hilbert scheme of Z inside this particular H. The space that parameterizes all curves inside this particular given surface. Well, okay. Can I write down a, an expression describing the space that parameterizes all curves over all members of this linear system. Yes, you can. And that's the relative Hilbert scheme. So if we fix, if we fix beta in a curve class in H2 integral homology of X and some number of, some number, some integer N, then the moduli space, the moduli space of two poles, Z sitting inside H, sitting inside X is the relative, relative Hilbert scheme of curves with N points on them and this is written this way, H tilde over the linear system. You see, what does this mean? It means that as soon as you give me a point in here, it cuts a particular page of the book for me. And then I'm looking at the Hilbert scheme of curves and points on that book. Do you understand this, Mohammed? Yep, a little bit, but yeah, the, the, the general picture seems, seems clear. Good. Okay, so the relative Hilbert scheme is called relative because I'm looking at some kind of universal Hilbert scheme of this big universal family of surfaces inside X. And it's relative with respect to the linear system, meaning that as soon as you pick a point in the linear system, I will get the Hilbert scheme of the surface that lies over that point. Okay? That's what it means. Okay, so that's what it is. And uh, so is the relative good Hilbert scheme relative, which is the okay, relative Hilbert scheme. This is that relative Hilbert scheme of one dimensional of one dimensional subschemes. Z of the universal of the universal um, hyperplane universal hyperplane whose push forward to X has fundamental class beta equal to class of C, which is the second churn character. You can read off homology class of a curve by looking at the second churn character of structure sheaf of that curve also. This we, can, we did this before. So who's push forward of what? So one dimensional subscheme, push forward of the one dimensional subscheme, right? in the ambient X has class beta, which is read off, read off from the churn character of the structure chief of that curve. And the second piece of information, holomorphic and with holomorphic Euler characteristic, Euler characteristics, uh, characteristics, uh, of 
the structure sheet of this curve to be equal to n. You see, that gives you a certain Hilbert scheme. Not only that, the way I wrote it now is give me a family of Hilbert schemes, right? Then you should learn from here many lessons. How algebraic geometer thinks about looking at curves which lie inside a surface which deforms inside an ambient variety X. It's like taking pictures of a movie. The H is changing and changing and changing, moving around an ambient surface. If you take snapshots of it, each one of these infinitesimal movements are themselves certain deformation of the original H. On each one of those snapshots, you're looking at a moduli space of curves and points deforming on it. And so, if you take the union of all those snapshots and look at the movie or cartoon that you're looking at, that is a certain Hilbert scheme. And that's the Hilbert scheme of the whole family. And that's that relative Hilbert scheme. As it is a Hilbert scheme, you need to parameterize the churn character, the churn class of, of the curve and the points that lie on the curve, okay? Is this clear? Yeah, this is perfectly clear, actually. Okay, great, very nice. So here's a theorem. Um, theorem. This is with my longtime friend and collaborator, Kolampur, myself, and Richard Thomas. We put this, um, we have, we looked at this problem, right? Suppose H, this surface, this hyperplane is sufficiently, or this hypersurface, I'm sorry, sufficiently positive. Sufficiently positive means the line bundle associated with this divisor is highly elevated, very elevated. With respect to what? With respect to with respect to um, this curve class H two sitting inside. There. So definitely, if I have this thick surface, and if I pick the curve class, there would be non-zero intersection between the surface and my curve. That's what it means. Okay, and n inside z and, and the uh, integer um, is chosen so that, so let's see what does this positivity mean. So uh, here is what we want. We would like um, to look at the following. So let's say I have O of x surjects onto O of z and, and then, this is ideal sheaf of z in x, yes, that's that. So this positivity with respect to the curve class is telling me about some communication between ampleness of the surface with respect to that curve. So here is that ampleness. I would like this condition to be satisfied. So this positivity is in the sense that sense that if I take ideal sheaf of Z in X and I twist it by H, this really means literally by definition, oh, X of H. Okay, if I have that, I would like cohomology of this ideal sheaf. Oops over x, of course. I want it to vanish for all i bigger than zero. Okay? For any ideal sheaf i, z, in x. If that's the case, then the theorem says, then the relative Hilbert scheme of curves with class data and 
all the characteristics of their structure should be equal to n of this universal hypersurface over the linear system of those things, this relative Hilbert dispute is a locally, now I need to tell you what this means, locally complete, modulized space, modulized space of torsion sheaves given by push forward of the ideal sheaves coherent sheaves where i from h to x is the map, is the embedding. Moreover, let me write down the theorem first. Moreover, it admits, it admits a perfect symmetric. Uh -huh. So this is interesting, perfect symmetric obstruction theory. So I can calculate invariance over this uh, relative Hilbert scheme. Seems like it has a nice deformation obstruction theory. And because this deformation obstruction theory is symmetric by what we have discussed, and so a virtual fundamental class, class of degree zero. The, degree of the virtual fundamental class is the difference of the dimension of the obstructions and deformations, rank, difference of the ranks. If it is symmetric, obstructions and deformations are isomorphic to each other. So the degree of the virtual cycle is zero. We have done this, okay? All right. So I like to basically tell you what does this statement of this theorem mean and why does it matter? Okay. So importance, importance of this theorem. This theorem is due to two reasons. First of all, what does it say? It says that this relative Hilbert scheme, whatever it is, first of all, looks like it parameterizes these curves and so on, sitting inside H, deforming inside ambient X. And locally, this parameterizing space is isomorphic to the premise of a different parameterizing space, which is the parameterizing space of um, Ideal shift of these curves, not, res not with respect to X, but with respect to H itself, when you push them forward into the X. You see, each member of this family is a surface, and then there is this Z deforming inside it. So this is basically saying, there is an ideal shift of this curve with respect to H, and there is an ideal shift of this curve with respect to the ambient X. And the space that parameterizes this system locally is isomorphic and also in the level of deformations to the space of sheaves you get by pushing forward ideal sheaf of these curves with respect to H into the ambient variety and thinking of them as sheaves and then looking at the moduli space of sheaves. And that moduli space of sheaves has a perfect symmetric obstruction, okay? So let's open this up really slowly so that we can understand this better. So far, do you have any questions? No, thanks. Okay. First of all, this importance of this theorem is due to the following thing. You see, first of all, let me show you, there is a difference between ideal sheaf of the curve inside X is not equal to ideal sheaf of the curve inside H. This is talking about ideal sheaf of the curve inside H. How are they related to each other? What is the relationship between these two ideal sheaves? Okay, here's the relationship. I can play a certain game, okay? Here is the game I can play. 
I have the structure sheets and I can send it to structure sheet of the curve. And I can look at the ideal sheet of the curve inside X. That's it. Because it's a curve deforming inside ambient threefold, this short exact sequence is definitely satisfied. At the same time, H is deforming inside X too. H is a subscheme of X. So I can take the same structure sheet of X and send it to structure sheet of the surface. And that has an ideal sheaf also. What is that? That is sheaf of functions vanishing along the surface. Now we do proper algebraic geometry. So O of X twisted by minus H, you know what that is. Okay. And then what? And then, at the same time, what you can do is, as you can see, Z is inside H, inside X. So Z is inside X, H is inside X. So I have write, written these two short exact sequences, but Z is also inside H, right? So look at it. There is obviously this also, which is true. And therefore this exact sequence also has a, ideal sheet, and that's the ideal sheet of the same curve Z, but with respect to H. Yes, so let me write it a bit differently inside H, right? Okay, this is a module of OH modules. So if I want to compare it to the rest of the diagram, I need to send it over into the ambient X. So I have this, map from H to X, I, can, I need to push it forward in order to compare everything, you see? This is exactly why we need to push forward because this lower, the bottom row of this diagram is a sequence of OH modules, clearly. And OH modules sit inside OX modules. Okay, how do you connect? If you do the diagram chasing, you can actually see that there is from this commutative diagram, a certain diagram, which you can complete the following way. That's it. Okay. As you can see, ideal sheaf of Z and H, which is this guy, is different, is not equal to ideal sheaf of Z in X. The difference of them is what sees the surface inside ambient X. So they're not the same, but of course they are related. And so this relation is ideal sheaf OX, ideal sheaf of H inside X maps to ideal sheaf of curve inside X maps to ideal sheaf of the push forward of the ideal sheaf of curve inside H rather. Is this clear? Yes. Okay. Ideal sheaf of Z in X, ideal sheaf of Z in H. Ideal sheet of H in X, but because H is a divisor, that's why I can write it as OX minus H. Okay, so that's what it is. Okay, so first of all, now we understand that this statement is really interesting. So, seems like we are saying that. The moduli space of Z inside H inside X is locally isomorphic to moduli space of these sheets. Okay. That's what we are trying to say. Okay. So now what about these sheets? First of all, if you look at any book in algebraic geometry, abstract algebra, ideals or ideal sheets are rank one sheets and torsion free. They don't have any torsion. Why is it? You can you can you kind of make sense of it? Yeah, of course you can make sense of it. Let's look at this um, this diagram below. 
Here we have a diagram of OH modules. O is a locally free sheaf. It's a vector bond, rank one. Doesn't have any torsion. If something sits inside it as a subsheaf, if it has torsion, that contradicts the torsion freeness of O of H. So as an OH module, this guy does not have any torsion. Pictorially, you can think of your H and then ideal sheath and the structure sheath are both basically supported everywhere without any torsion. So this is O of H and this is ideal sheath of Z in H. The difference between them is that this thing is almost the same as the vector bundle of rank one, but because it's an ideal sheaf of a curve, only on the curve, its values become zero. It's supported everywhere, but it vanishes along a particular locus of Z inside H. Nevertheless, as an OH module, it is torsion free, okay? If it is not, that contradicts O of H being torsion free. Okay, so this sheaf that I'm showing with these arrows, think about, I'm kind of trying to give you an intuition of a bundle, is supported on H. Now, support of this sheaf in here is two dimensional. So this has two dimensional support. Why? Because H is two dimensional. As you embed it into the ambient variety, dimension of the ambient variety is three. So co-dimension of this sheaf is one because it's supported as a torsion-free sheaf on H, but it's not torsion-free in X. What is torsion-free in X is this guy. This is torsion-free in X. Torsion-free. Again, this is torsion-free in X. This is also torsion free in X. It's a line bundle, torsion free also in X, you see? But this part is torsion. Co dimension one in X. Torsion means its support has dimensions less than dimension of the ambient variety. So torsion means that. Torsion sheet means that. Okay? So now you can understand that this theorem is actually pretty nice and interesting. The moduli space that parameterizes a system of curves and points sitting inside an ambient surface, deforming inside X, is identifiable locally and deformation theoretically with a moduli space of torsion sheaves in X, which are push forward of ideal sheaf of Z in H. Even though ideal sheaves are torsion free, this is ideal shape of Z as an OH module. So it's torsion free with respect to dimension two, but it's torsion with respect to dimension of the ambient variety three. Okay, so as such, we are looking at coherent sheaves which are torsion in X. So the sheaves, the sheaves, I lower star of ideal shape of Z inside H are torsion co-dimension one with co-dimension one support on H, which is a member of the linear system that we just had, yes. And need not be semi-stable when H is reducible or non-reduced. Okay, what is going on here? What is that supposed to mean? Here is what we mean by that. Um, semi-stable means, if you have a sheaf, you call it semi-stable if the slope of the sub sheaf of it is always less than the slope of the sheaf. We discussed the semi-stability and the stability before. So if I have one of these surfaces, and if I look at system of points and curves with this subscheme Z in it, 
If H deforms into something which is reducible, H deforms until it can, it can, it's allowed to have all possible deformations and it can deform into something like union of H1 and H2. Then this curve can break into pieces. So some of the points will be here, some of the points will be here, okay? Now I can say that this curve is broken into pieces Z1 and Z2. Z1 lying is skin theoretically on H1, Z2 lying is skin theoretically on H2, class of Z1 being beta 1, class of Z2 being beta 2. Okay. So what I can do is, is that um, I can look at the sheaves that we are saying the moduli space is isomorphic to the moduli space of these things, right? So right now, the whole, the picture is ideal sheaf of Z1 union Z2 inside H1 union H2. Question is, push forward into the unknown variety. Is this stable or at least semi-stable? Okay. If it has a subsheaf, if it has a subsheaf, whose slope is bigger than the slope of this one, it's not being stable, okay? Is this semi-stable, okay? So one can show that, one can show that if this curve class beta two times L, is bigger than beta one times L for L align inside the surface H. So this is L, yes. Then the pull back, push forward of I, Z, and H is not um, stable as a sheaf in coherent category of coherent shifts in X. Because ideal shift of I, ideal shift of Z1 in H1 will destabilize, destabilize ideal shift of I of Z1 union Z2 in H1 union H2. Do you understand it, Mohammed? Mm -hmm. I can say. What is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is basically saying that if your curve class breaks in a in a in, in a particular way that the one part of it is thicker than the other part, then one ideal shift of one part is a still a subshift of the, uh, the whole thing and that can destabilize. We have seen an example of this thing. We discussed about the stability of the line bundles. There is a notion of a slope for vector bundles. Vector bundles, let's say if I have a vector bundle, then the slope of the vector bundle, which is called mu, for instance, is the degree of V divided by the rank of V. We have discussed this before. If my vector bundle is something like O of one plus O of two, for instance, example, then its slope mu of V is equal to degree of it three, sum of the two degrees divided by rank two. But then obviously there is this thing sitting inside V whose degree mu of O two is its degree two divided by one. You see two is bigger than three halves. So it has a sub bundle whose slope is bigger. Very similar situation happens in here. When you're looking at coherent sheaves, there is a notion of a slope or reduced Hilbert polynomial. So if you have some coherent sheaf and it has a sub coherent sheaf such that it's reduced Hilbert polynomial, poly of F is less than reduced Hilbert poly 
of f prime, even though f prime is being a subshift, then it said that f is unstable. That is what's actually happening in here. The reason that you kind of do not really see what's going on in here is because I didn't tell you that the Hilbert polynomial of ideal shift of z1 inside h1 and ideal shift of z2 inside h2 can be calculated in terms of these two numbers. Okay, so ideal shift of Z1 union Z2 inside H1 union H2 also can be calculated in terms of beta. So the point is that if beta one, beta two times L is bigger than beta one times L, one of these ideal sheets, which actually sits inside here, will have a reduced Hilbert polynomial bigger than reduced Hilbert polynomial of the original sheet. Therefore, this original sheaf can always and always have a subsheaf, which is a result of certain this particular deformation process. And that sheaf can always be there. You cannot avoid it. And that sheaf will always destabilize your coherent torsion sheaf. Okay? Sorry. So uh, are these, uh, I have a question here. So yeah. are these ideal sheaves like um, you're making correspondence of Z1 to beta two here? Is this, this yes. really? Yeah, so this is the ideal sheaf of Z1 inside H1 pushed into this ambient variety. And this is the ideal sheaf of Z2 inside H2 pushed into the ambient variety. And this is the ideal sheaf of the whole system pushed into. Okay, and so this, this pushed ideal, forward of, of... Yeah, so this ideal sheaf of Z1 inside Z2, this looks like a bundle that is supported on H1. An ideal sheaf of Z, uh, Z, Two inside H2, it also looks like a bundle, torsion three on H2. This particular first bundle vanishes zero along this curve. The second one vanishes along the second curve. So both of them are torsion free, one as an OH1 module, the other as an OH2 module. But when you push them both separately into the ambient variety, this is a coherent sheaf, which is torsion. This is a coherent sheaf, which is also a torsion. This is a coherent sheaf, which is also a torsion. Everything is torsion. Now this torsion sheaf, this is a subsheaf of this torsion sheaf. It's like F and R F prime. And F prime will have a Hilbert polynomial or reduced Hilbert polynomial, which will be bigger than the reduced Hilbert polynomial of F. And now you might ask, what is a reduced Hilbert polynomial anyway? Reduced Hilbert polynomial is a ratio, very similar to degree divided by rank. Reduced Hilbert polynomial is basically reduced Hilbert poly, okay? Is the Hilbert polynomial of that sheaf, Hilbert poly, uh, for instance, divided by something that captures the rank. So leading coefficient, leading coefficient of Hilbert polynomial basically. Okay, so that's what it is. You have a polynomial, for instance, 2m cubed plus uh, 12m plus uh, 50. Okay, that's, let's say this is our hill poly. Hill poly. Okay, reduced hill poly is this, 2m3 plus 12m plus 15 divided by 2. So it is actually m3 plus 6m plus 15 divided by two, okay? So reduced Hilbert polynomial of this guy will be a polynomial and you're comparing it to the reduced Hilbert polynomial of the, the other sheet. Now, how do you compare two, two polynomials? Let's say you have F prime and F, reduced Hill poly of this and reduced Hill poly of this. So let's say this is the my example, so M3, plus, I don't know, 6M plus 15 over two. And let's say this ambient sheaf is M3 over two plus, uh, I don't know, 7M plus 27. As you're trying to compare these two things, you let M goes to infinity, okay? As you do that, you ask yourself, which one grows faster? Of course, this one. So this is bigger than the other one because the leading coefficient of one is bigger than the leading coefficient of the other. If that happens, then we say that the reducible polynomial of this is bigger than that. 
grows faster as m goes to infinity. Okay, so this is exactly what we are doing. You have this system of curve inside H. H has deformed into H1 union H2. Curve has split into Z1 union Z2. And then each one of these things give me a torsion sheet. And one of the torsion, and these torsion sheaves are still sub-torsion sheaves of the torsion sheaf of the whole picture. And one of them destabilizes that. So this statement of this theory is actually pretty interesting because seems like we are saying that the moduli space of curves inside H inside X is a uh, equal to the moduli space of these torsion sheaves, but these torsion sheaves are not always stable with respect to the reduced hyperpolynomial stability condition. So what is that stability condition with respect to which we are trying to call them stable. If they are not stable, then you cannot study it. You cannot compute deformations. You cannot do anything with it. Okay? So that's what we are doing. This is a profound statement because these torsion sheets are not even stable. So that's one reason this theorem is interesting. The other is that second reason for the theorem to be interesting is the following. Deformations, deformations of push forward of ideal sheaf of Z in H might not, might not a priori, okay? B of the same form, B, um, B, how do I say? B sheaves of the same form. Okay, what does this mean really? Let's go back to the statement of the theorem. We say that, the theorem says that this moduli space of Z in H inside X is a locally complete moduli space of torsion sheaves given always as push forward of ideal sheaves. When you have a sheaf which might not even need to be stable and you deform it, it's not guaranteed that it always remains as the push forward of an ideal sheaf. I can deform this thing into some F prime and the price I might be paying is that F prime will no longer sit inside O of H. If you say that your moduli space is always moduli space of ideal sheaves, you're assuming that, or you have a particular reason to say that, I start from ideal sheaves, I deform them, and they would be still ideal sheaves. So this theorem is very a strong theorem, it seems. One is that, seems like, it's considering these torsion sheaves with a different stability condition because it's using, if it is using reduced Hilbert polynomial criteria, which is called Giesecker stability. With respect to that, sheaves are not stable. Second one, any moduli space captures information of deformations of sheaves. Seems like we are saying that this moduli space is cooked up in a way that the affirmations of these ideal sheaves is still remaining as an ideal sheaf. Is this even true? Why? Yes. Do you see the significance of this? Yes, after the last explanation, yes, it makes sense. Perfect. Okay. All right. So this, by the way, this reduced Hilbert polynomial business. Um, this is uh, called Giesecke stability criteria. This is the stability we consider when you look at the sheaf moduli spaces. Okay. All right. So this is interesting. Uh, torsion sheaves of the same form, i.e., they could be. They could be 
arbitrary arbitrary portion sheaves of the same topological type type like I star of L push forward of some line bundle of a general line bundle on a hyper surface H, okay, but L might not sit as a as a subsheaf of O of H. But we are saying it does. And we don't know why. So this is the significance of a result of a theorem I'm trying to point out in here, okay? Saying that this moduli space is always locally complete moduli space of torsion sheaves given as push forward of ideal sheaves is a strong statement, okay? Now let us see why this is the case. So as I showed you, as soon as you give me a, sub scheme Z inside H inside X, I can always complete the diagram and I can always get this blue completed short exact sequence right here. So let us look at this thing. So, so we always given, so here is the proof given Z in H in X, we showed that that we will get, we will obtain an induced short exact sequence, OX minus H goes to ideal sheaf of Z with respect to X, goes to push forward of ideal sheaf of Z with respect to H. Okay. All right. Now, as you can see, as soon as you give me one of these ideal sheaves, this is a two-term complex. I'm gonna call this one I dot. This I dot understands how the curve sits inside X and how the surface sits inside X two. And for every one of these curves, I dot is always quasi-isomorphic to this, you see, because the left side of I dot is zero, right side of this sheaf is also zero. So this is basically saying I dot is equal, right? Because now that I put them, two of them next to each other, the two, the remaining part is only one part, which is push forward of this. So they are equal to each other. When you give me one of these curves, when you fix this system, this I dot becomes quasi isomorphic to this torsion sheet pushed into the ambient variety. The statement of the theorem really says that after deformation, this quasi isomorphism does not break. Okay, so viewing, viewing the above short exact sequence in the derived category, bounded derived category of X, we observe that I dot becomes quasi isomorphic to I lower star of ideal sheaf of Z in H. So we might be able to associate a rather different suitable stability condition, stability condition, okay, to I lower star of I Z of H, since we can view this torsion sheet 
portion sheet as the complex OX minus H goes to I of ZX from the on. Do you see it? Same comp, same sheet. This sheaf and this complex are the same object. This has a notion of Giesecker semi-stability, which really doesn't work. I showed you an example of this. With respect to that stability, this can be unstable. Complexes, objects in drive category, live in their own world, and there are different notions of stabilities for them. So because this complex and this sheaf are the same, quasi-isomorphic in drive category, I can always think of this sheaf as an object in the derived category and use the stability of I dot for it. Why? Because it is I dot. So as soon as you choose a different stability condition, then you might be able to construct a nice well-behaved modular space. Are you with me on this? Yes. Okay. Uh, here we used a different stability condition known as joy sum stability. This is the following. Here's the definition. Uh, uh, Joyce song stable pair stable pair is a pair E and S in space of sections of E such that first of all E is a coherent sheaf, E is a semi stable, okay, with respect to H, and S is a um, section which does not factor, not factor through, through a, any destabilizing subsheaf of E, subsheaf of E. So you have a map from this Non zero section O to E. Okay. All right. This is semi stable with respect to ample polarization H. Okay. And okay. So the point is that. Um, why is this helpful for us? Because look at it. Now, if I have this sheaf, we showed it. This sheaf is not always, not always, not always Giesecker stable or semi-stable. We showed it, it can get destabilized. But this is isomorphic to, in the draft category to a complex O of X, minus h to i z of x. Okay, so this is after twisting the right hand side, I can put it like this, like that. And twisting this uh, doesn't change things. I can twist that one. So basically I just multiplied everything by h. This is torsion free is still torsion free in X, not in H, in X, torsion free in X, it's an ideal shift, always a stable actually. E secure is stable because it's an ideal shift, not in H, but in the ambient variety, it's, it's always a stable. And this section is always non vanishing So this part of it is always Joyce Song 
stable. Because this complex is the same as this torsion sheath, I can think of torsion sheath always as a joist song stable pair. So instead of looking at the moduli space of E secure semi stable torsion sheets, I look at the moduli space of joist song semi stable torsion sheets such that uh, instead of the torsion sheath, I think of the two term complex. Okay, so this is the fixing the stability situation. Now, all we need to prove is that if we deform Z in H in X to um, Z prime in H prime in X a little bit, yes, then under such infinitesimal infinitesimal affirmations, affirmations I dot is always represented by a choice song pair O of X goes to ideal sheaf again of Z prime in X twisted by H prime. Okay, so if I deform this thing, it's naturally always equal to some deformation of I dot. Question is, is this equal still to a two-term complex Z prime in X twisted by H prime or not? If I can show that, Deformation of the complex object in the derived category always will be some other object I dot prime, such that I dot prime is this particular two term complex. Then I have proved that no matter how this side deforms, it's always going to be the same as O with a map to ideal sheet. Then that means that this itself is the torsion, right? So basically, here is maybe I should do it this way. So originally it is like this, equal to I dot, equal to O X I of Z in X, like that. Then I deform it. I become some F prime. I don't know what this looks like. This deforms into some I dot prime. We know that these two are equal. If I can show that this is the same as O X I of Z prime in X twisted by H prime. That then implies that this F prime has to be isomorphic to push forward of some ideal shift of Z prime in X in H. So that, that basically shows that with respect to this new stability, this torsion shift is always a particular type of a torsion shift, which is ideal shift of a curve inside the deformation of that sentence. And that's the statement of the theorem. So the theorem is about derived category deformation theory. I need to deform I dot to I dot prime and show that I dot prime is equal to that particular two term complex. Any questions? Yes or no? No, no. Good. Are you with me on this? Yes. Okay. All right. So deformation theory is a complicated discussion. So, so far, I hope that you understood how the proof goes. Okay. And let us discuss about the proof of deformation compatibility. Proof of deformation compatibility next time. So, goal of next time.
I'm going to deform this in derived category. I can always do it. And that deformation is always the deformation of the ideal torsion sheaf on the left, which is F prime. But the goal is to prove this. If I can show I dot is equal again to something that looks exactly like the previous one, then I can say that, aha, uh -huh, this comes from a short exact sequence. F prime sits inside, you know, uh, basically this way, sorry. O, X, and, and okay, sorry. This way, yes? So this becomes F prime, and it always would be the quotient of this map. And if it is the map from O to ideal sheet, F prime has to be itself an ideal sheet pushed into the ambient right. The beautiful picture. Okay. Um, let us uh, continue this later. All of this we are doing because we are trying to find a sheaf theoretic translation of the formation theory and the moduli space of a flag where Z sits a scheme theoretically inside H deforming in X. After we prove the theorem, then you can see how beautifully we can count these things. Um, instead of counting torsion sheaves, I will just count, count these. Yeah, question. Go ahead. No. No. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Uh, let us uh, continue on Wednesday. Uh,